Okay, we've talked about the sarcomere as the small, con, smallest contractile unit of the um, muscle, but the motor unit is the smallest functional unit because it has both the motor unit, so the nerve, and the muscle fibers that generate the force. But you need both of those connected to actually have any sort of muscle function. So one thing that we're going to discuss over and over as we go through these um, muscle mechanics modules is that muscle is able to control its volume, okay? In, in a sense, muscle can generate small amounts of force to pick up small pieces of paper, say, and you can generate large amounts of force to lift heavy weights. And so it's pretty amazing that one muscle can do all these ranges of motions. So we're going to keep in mind all the factors that modulate or change the muscle force production as we go through these modules. And in this particular module, the motor unit, there are four different ways that the, the muscle volume or muscle force production can be altered. So let's define the motor unit. Motor unit is the motor nerve and all the muscle fibers that it innervates. Okay, so it's a very specific definition. A motor unit consists of the motor neuron and all the muscle fibers it innervates. This definition of a motor unit brings us to the first way that muscles can modulate force production, and that is the motor unit size. Because that one motor neuron can either innervate a small number of muscle fibers for very precise movements, say in your hands, your fingers, or around your eye, or it can innervate a large number of muscle fibers, say on the order of 2,000 muscle fibers, um, and generate larger force. So say um, motor units in your quadriceps would be much larger than motor unit size in your um, muscles surrounding your eyes. Another interesting feature of your motor units or the way that the motor units are dispersed within the muscle is um, that they're not in one section of the muscle. So if you look at this image, motor unit one, which is the light peach color, light tan color, has motor muscle fibers that are spread throughout the muscle, as with motor unit two and motor unit three. So they're, they're they're not in, in regions, they're spread throughout the muscle. What's the advantage of that? One advantage is if you have an injury to one part of your muscle, say the lateral side of your quadriceps, you're not cutting out an entire motor unit, right? You may damage one of the muscle fibers within a motor unit, but you're not rendering that part of your muscle basically unfunctional. The second way that your muscles can generate more force is through the recruitment of additional motor units. So as your force production requirements increase in a muscle, they will um, recruit more and more motor units to, to meet those force needs. The way in which motor units are recruited is, is referred to as the size principle. And the size principle is based on the motor neuron size. So it recruits from smaller motor neurons to larger motor neurons. And these motor units, as they're recruited, remain active until the force is reduced. Okay, so typically the first motor unit that is recruited is a, uh, a slow twitch motor unit that doesn't fatigue fast, right, but also generates um, less force than, say, a larger motor, um, a, a fast twitch motor unit. So these slow Motor units are recruited first, and then the um, fast twitch motor units are recruited later. How they're de-recruited is in reverse order. So the last one recruited is the first one de-recruited, and it goes back to the first motor unit that was recruited. And there's a graph of this in the, in the following slide. So here we see the, the method of recruitment. So as more motor units are recruited, um, they increase in size and increase in force production. So motor unit one comes on first. If you need more muscle force, motor unit two is recruited. 
motor unit three, and motor unit four until that force requirement is met. When the force requirement decreases and you de-recruit these motor units, motor unit number four turns off first, followed by three, two, and then one. Okay, this slide takes us back to, to physiology. So it describes a twitch that eventually goes to a tetanus muscle contraction or a fused muscle contraction. So as you learned or will learn in physiology, you have a depolarization or a stimulus action potential, and, which results in a twitch. Now, if you put in another action potential or another stimulus before that twitch relaxes completely, you'll get this summation of these forces. So this number two wave summation. If you increase the, the frequency of these um, stimuli, then you'll get an unfused, incomplete muscle contraction. And then finally, when the rate of stimulus, or what we call the rate coding, is fast enough, you get a complete, smooth muscle contraction. Okay, so rate coding, or the, the, the speed at which you stimulate, stimulate the muscle fiber, results in an increased tension or an increased force. So rate coding is the third way to modulate this muscle force production. So here we have it summarized very simply. The rate of action potential discharge increases the muscle force. So if you increase rate coding, you increase muscle force. Another thing to keep in mind when, say on an exam, you're being asked for ways that muscle force is modulated or um, changed, when you think of rate coding, always think of recruitment. Recruitment and rate coding tend to go together. So here is an image of motor unit recruitment from the first motor unit, second, third, fourth, and fifth with the concept of rate coding overlaid on that recruitment strategy. So as you recruit the first motor unit, its rate coding is at a slower frequency, and then throughout the contraction, it speeds up. Right, so force increases after that motor unit is recruited. Then you recruit motor unit two at a slower frequency of rate coding, and that speeds up during the contraction. And the same for three, four, and then five. So the fourth way to modulate muscle force production is through motor unit type. It's very similar to fiber type, fast twitch, slow twitch, intermediate fiber types, but it, it also is the same way within the whole functional motor unit. Okay, and so this image kind of shows the difference in force production between fast twitch motor units at the top, A, and slow twitch motor units at the bottom, C. So along the right-hand side of that graph, you see lines that represent um, force, so 200 millinewtons. So that's the scale bar. And if you notice, the twitch or the muscle force for the slow twitch motor unit, when it's at its maximal force production, is about 200 millinewtons. When you go up to the fast twitch motor unit at when it starts to get into a tetanus muscle contraction, it's well above almost two times 200 millinewton scale bar, right? So this is illustrating that the fast twitch motor units generate more force compared to the slow twitch. So the type of motor unit modulates force production. So here we have this concept of motor unit type just written out. So you have your fast twitch, motor units, which have large motor neurons, right? So they're recruited later when you have high force requirements from your muscle. They are fast twitch and easily fatigued. Then you have the oxidative glycolytic, kind of your mid-range, um, which have intermediate motor neurons attached to these um, muscle fibers. And then you have the slow twitch motor unit, which is slow oxidative, small motor neurons. And these are recruited first and they stay on through the whole muscle contraction and then are de-recruited last. So we've covered four ways within motor unit lecture that um, ways to modulate muscle force production.
First is the motor unit size, how many muscle fibers are innervated by that one motor neuron. Second is the recruitment of motor units. Third is the rate coding, the increase in rate coding of those recruited motor units. And the fourth is the type of motor unit that is recruited. All of these four modulate muscle force production.